bit of experimental practice as a public artist. And um, today I'm going to talk about the camera obscura. I've, I built one and it was installed on campus here for a few months, which is where Thomas saw it. Um, but it has a, for me, it, <laughs> I've been fascinated by the camera obscura ever since this phone call. This was back in graduate school. My friend Bob, um, going to MIT's Center for Advanced Visual Studies, said, come on over to my apartment. I'm like, well, okay. You know, I was going to art school. So I run over there and, uh, you know, because what is a camera obscura? What is it? I come in the door and it was the most incredible thing. I don't know if you've experienced this, but his living room is up a few floors in Central Square, Cambridge, Mass, and there's a red bricked uh, church with a tall spire. So you black out all your windows with like plastic garbage bags or cardboard so no light can get in except for in a small aperture. This is the basics of a camera obscura and due to the principles of light, um, the outside comes in upside down and transposed. So all of a sudden there's this giant <laughs> church um, upside, the steeple sort of falling across the floor. Of course, we didn't have cell phones then, so we don't have any pictures of it that I know of. But, um, you know, Bob and I are both pretty talkative, and I have to say we just sat there and looked at it for like half an hour. And it was what we were used to seeing, but it wasn't what we were used to seeing. It was a really remarkable, um, it was reality, but it wasn't. And it just stunned us. And we sat there for, as I said, a long time and just looked at it in wonder and in silence. So this image will give you a little bit of the flavor of it. To my mind, it's not nearly as powerful <laughs> as my friend Bob Rosinski's, but um, this is a very famous photographer, Abe Morell, who's gone around for decades now and turned rooms into camera obscuras. So this is a view of Central Park and you'll get the flavor of this dream state, although it's reality. There's the part coming in upside down and transposed. How many of you guys have been in a camera obscure or seen them? So a few of you, yeah. Would you agree they're pretty wonderful? Yeah, I see some nodding, yeah. So I've long been fascinated with them and um, here on campus, Northrop Auditorium, Northrop New Northrop, we call it. It started a sort of pop-up program last year, and I was commissioned to create a, a pop-up project. And I thought, well, this is sort of around the idea of performing in public, and you know, it's our, um, our, it's our concert venue in some way. So um, I thought, this is my chance to make a camera obscura. This is my science slide. And <laughs> I'm sure that many of you will be able to understand this readily, but um, you know, light comes in straight and when it hits that hole, or you can put in a lens um, to clarify the image, um, they can't scatter, they focus and they flip. Maybe during the question part, some other people can ask me more about that and I can ask you more about that. <clears throat> So actually it's, it's very ancient and some of the speculation has been like, well there must have been a wooden room with like a knot in a plank or something and that wooden knot maybe fell out and the outside came in upside down. You know, who knows? Many people have talked about um, potential, you know, starting points. Um, they were known in ancient Asia. Um, I think Aristotle talked about the camera obscura, ancient. So they've been um, cross-culturally sort of discovered and used, as this image shows, um, they were used not just for wonder, but oftentimes for a, to draw, to draw from. You could put paper over that and draw. So right before I got the chance to build my camera obscura, I went to a conference in Scotland. I had the opportunity to go to a conference in Scotland in Edinburgh. And um, believe it or not, um, there's an amazing camera obscura in Edinburgh. Um, and of course, I ran right there when I arrived. Uh, it's at the top of that tower. And Patrick Geddes, who's a um, well-known sociologist and town planner, he bought that building in the late 1800s, but it was already a camera obscura 
from like 1852, so the Scots are very, <laughs> there's camera obscuras all over Scotland. Um, so instead of calling it the Lookout Tower, he called it the Outlook Tower. And according to the brochure at the, at the, uh, at the Outlook Tower, what he liked to do is rush people up the back stairs to the top of the building, so it's like maybe six flights of stairs. He wanted them to be out of breath, sort of dizzy, and panting as they sat and looked at the camera obscura. So this is the postcard image because they don't like you to take pictures, but you have a marvelous view of Edinburgh. And so he really felt that by seeing the world, seeing the town in this sort of holistic way, like um, the larger patterns, he was somebody who brought in the concept of region to architecture, that, that um, it would not, what would not only be educational, but it would serve sort of a larger social good that we see ourselves connected to larger systems and worlds and patterns. So, so he was known for bringing people up there and exposing them to his outlook tower. And then he had a room called the inlook room <laughs> where he wanted you then to go and sit and kind of meditate on the experience you'd, you'd had in the outlook tower. So it actually is pretty amazing in that you're um, sitting around this round disc that is bringing it in from the sky. I can, I'll show you a section of that in a minute, but it's like a performance. Um, there's an operator who moves the camera and two tiers of seating, and um, it sort of underscores the power of these ancient devices. Um, people of all ages, and it's kind of exciting because you have to get a ticket for a specific time, and it feels very sort of special and amazing. And then you have a chance to go out on the roof and see the city itself. So then I had signed up for the field trip on this conference and we're going to the top of Cairngorm Mountain and it turns out there's a camera obscure there as well, and just built a few years ago. And so it shows you a view of the uh, Scottish Highlands. And I think what this did for me was that, you know, when I was at the Outlook Tower, I was by myself. And when I was here, I was with my colleagues and um, you know, a lot of architects, landscape architects, artists, different scholars, a mixed group of folks, and, you know, everybody was really fascinated. Everybody wanted to kind of huddle around this and, and spend time with it and kind of underscored, like, you know, even in this era of Oculus Rift, you know, that maybe this sort of ancient device would still be pretty powerful as a walk-in camera obscure room on campus. <clears throat> So this is that section I was going to talk to you about. The Gettys Tower and the Cairngorm Tower use this idea of a mirror this, and <clears throat> a lens to bring the image down to this round, white, usually they're plastered circles. And there's an operator that can move the uh, lens so that they can show you the whole panorama. And these were like a Victorian kind of obsession and they were frequently built in places of like tourist attraction. So you could see this incredible landscape in a new way and painters would use them and paint and that kind of thing. That's a complicated camera obscura. Since I was gonna be building this myself with my chief student carpenter, Christopher Tallman, a graduate student in landscape architecture. I mean, that's me on the left. Um, and Emily Stover also helped. So we built this over at Rapson Hall, which is the architecture building, um, in modules so that we could move it over to um, Northrop Plaza. So Northrop Plaza is like the, it's like the uh, epicenter of the U of M East Bank mm -hmm. campus. And there's the auditorium and Morrill Hall where the president is, is the building to this side and admissions is that side. And, um, so there's the camera obscura. I call it the black box camera obscura. Anything can happen in a black box, I decided. Um, it was also fascinating to me as we built this, no one ever asked us what we were doing or why we were doing it. I just thought, you know, I didn't have any permits or do anything, put up any signs. I just thought, that's really interesting. I could be building a whatever, you know. Um, so that was really, and that was up a long time under construction. So that was really an interesting part of it too. 
So this is the camera obscura is looking down Northrop Mall it's called towards Kaufman Union that's the big student union you're going to be um, getting on the buses. Um, so it occupies this really sort of amazing they let me do it but on the other hand I guess I just kind of did it um, this this presence on campus. So here's the front of the building and this this idea of the black box camera obscura, it's made out of wood that's been burned. Um, we wanted it to look unusual and iconic. Um, burned wood is a way to seal wood, and it's actually an ancient technique. Um, it's got a rubber roof. It was built in the fall. It let, was up all winter and into the spring. It was never designed to be permanent. So I wanted it to feel like, um, almost like a magic box, you know, when magicians open boxes. So, <clears throat> oh, you probably notice our clever use of identifying that it's a camera obscura. And this has some information on it. And that's when it's locked. It was locked at night and opened in the morning, closed every night. And um, here's me. The doors are open, and that has information. And when the doors are open, you see that there's these curtains, because the camera obscura won't work as well unless it's really dark. So I was frequently over there or inviting people to come in and see the camera obscura or um, talk with them. There were four low stools in the building so that you could sit and see the image. So this is what you'd see. And um, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> we, we left until the last minute the inserting the lens into the, I had to do some math. There was a little equation. So I was, I was worried about that. And I'm like, I can't believe I'm leaving the lens to the last minute. But we put it in there and it was perfect. So it was, and it, that's about how big it looked when you were inside the camera obscura because the building was about eight by eight by eight. So the whole white wall, that's what it looked like. And what was kind of fascinating, and I'll show you a little clip, but you know, there's the sun and the steam would be, you know, and grasses. And so this, it was very hypnotic. And one of my, a few of my colleagues came over and a woman that works with me sat down and you know she was very quiet for quite a while and she goes you know I feel weird in here I'm feeling weird and I'm like um, Amanda do you think you might be well she's like I feel I feel like I'm I don't know I feel different I feel weird I might, I might be breathing differently I said do you think you might be relaxed and she's like yeah I, I think I might be relaxed <laughs> yeah yeah I'm like <laughs> so uh, I think it was relaxing for a lot of people. And it also was a fascinating place where since it had the four chairs and you didn't know who might be in there, sometimes you're in there by yourself, sometimes people would come in or leave, so you'd have conversations oftentimes with strangers. That was really interesting about perception and um, the campus and sight and how is this possible and what is this and et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so it did uh, spark a lot of interest. Here's this honors student in media studies who wanted to make, a, he made a film, a short video about it. Um, it's, that's online, so I could uh, find that or share that with you guys. Um, you know, the unusual quality of the, uh, the burned, and then around, wrapping around the top, we had laser cut camera obscura sort of over and over, and you can see the lens and the and sort of the center panel of that piece. Um, here's just, you know, an architectural uh, beauty shot. But I think um, it was mysterious to a lot of people. The construction workers that were working on Northrop really liked it. And um, actually, I did get asked one time by somebody coming out of Morrill Hall. And she was very, she was kind of like, what are you, what's going on? What is this? And she was very sort of suspicious and strange. And then when she found out I was a professor, she was much different to me. It was really interesting how you interact with the construction guys and the moral hall guys, right? <clears throat> now is this my, is this my, uh, is that my video? Oh, okay, good. So I want to show you what it was like, some days at least, what it felt like to um, sit in there.
So people were sitting in there going, I didn't know we walked like that. That doesn't look how we, like what we really walk like. Um, things like that. I mean, it was pretty hypnotic. And, and then some people would go outside and come back in. They would try to sort of see what they were seeing and then go back in. Um, so it's every, it was every day, but it wasn't. It felt very unusual and very hypnotic and a lot of uh, beautiful kind of conversations. Um, well, let me show you a couple other things. This room is very bright, so it's hard to see, but um, maybe you can detect there's two figures here. And what, they, what we did, or what they did, I uh, found out about it. I mean, things are going on in the camera obscura um, that were really interesting. People would use it in kind of their own way. So they, they had pinned up a big white sheet of paper. And it's hard to see, but they are, yeah, there you go. See, this, this fellow, there's two guys in here, two art students. They put up a piece of paper, and that's his pencil. He's tracing the outline and making a drawing about uh, Kaufman and Union in the mall. And so that's actually how they were originally used. They didn't know that, but they just thought it would be fascinating to do that. And so um, one fellow started out his own drawing, and then he worked with this other guy to make a collaborative drawing. So I found that pretty fascinating. So I said, oh, let's do some more. Let's make a show, et cetera, et cetera. So I got really excited. So this is almost my last slide, but I, w I wanted to just mention that um, so it seemed like artists and art students and the art faculty um, started to learn about the camera obscura. One day when I was in there, a geology student was in there and he said his professor had sent out an email about go to the camera obscura because they were used as some of the early drawing devices and in geology, which I had no idea. So they were all asked to go there. Then um, a comparative literature uh, faculty member emailed me and told me she was using the camera obscura as like a writing prompt, as sort of a um, place to go, and she would give them sort of prompts about writing. Um, at Northrop events, we were typically, on, it was only open on weekdays, but if there's a big Northrop event, in the spring we kept it open, and one day we had 60 people waiting in line to go in the camera obscura. They wanted to see um, what would happen, and I guess, just this idea of individuals and groups, um, you know, like I'd be walking by and I'd see, you know, I see, oh, I saw a student walking out of the camera obscura. She's just like, you know, she just had this look on her face, like, and she just looked at me. I don't know if she thought I made it or what, but she just said, how? How did they do that? How did they do that? And so um, I would see kind of a look of wonder or interest in people's faces. And, um, also, sometimes there would be small groups that would be brought out from a class or a whatever. I'd see them going in and out. So it was really gratifying. My building is near uh, this space, so I could, not only did I sit in it, but I got to observe a lot of this um, activity. So um, just, a, just as a kind of a footnote, if you Google like Camera Obscura 2015, there are just camera obscura is constantly being made. I mean, there's still power to this. There's a mobile, the camper obscura. <laughs> a mobile obscura. This is just, this is uh, this, this year in New York, um, you know, walk-in camera obscura. That's a, a giant camera obscura that looks like a, you know, it's kind of the forerunner of photography, so they look like a photography. And there's a camera obscura that's actually looking at something inside, like a, like a, you know, an artwork that's being transposed. So even though it's this ancient device, I have to say I found it really, um, I mean, it was really a privilege to be able to build that, and it was such a, a joy to see it um, being used in all sorts of ways I didn't expect. I probably should have designed some type of survey, or how could I find out how all these people were using it. Um, when I had to take it down, um, there I was. <laughs> Being, uh, taking it down, yes, in the, in the spring, and um, a woman, and we were doing it at night, of course, and crazy, but a woman uh, walked by and she goes, oh, are you the, did you make this? And I'm like, yeah, um, yep, and now we're taking it down, it's going to be, you know, turned into some um, furnishings for temporary 
park downtown by student construction. So that was nice. It was being recycled. But she's like, I just want to tell you what, uh, you know, what a difference this has made in my life here. I just want to let you know. I'm just so glad that I've been able to run across you and uh, meet you. And then she sent me a follow-up email. So um, very qualitative, but it seemed to have a kind of a beautiful and fun uh, impact on campus. Plus, always employ your students, bring your students into it, right? So um, we, uh, we were a construction team as well. So thank you very much, Tom, for inviting me. Thank and thank you all. For